Well, hi. Um, we're back with a very interesting part of John 12. And I have to say, for all the times I've listened to John 12 in when they've read the scriptures in you know church services or different times that I may have read it myself, I do not remember this part. So when I was reading it, I really had to go over it a couple of times. And um, I don't know, it's just kind of fascinating to me. I think mostly because... I think it should be familiar to me, and it isn't familiar to me at all. So um, there are kind of some a few surprises in here, at least for me. So we're starting in verse 27 of John 12. And remember, uh, Philip had just brought some Greeks to Jesus and asked if they could have a word with him. And he begins teaching everybody um, about how everyone is welcome in into God's kingdom. But then all of a sudden, he kind of changes a little bit and begins to think about what's to come and he says this is Jesus talking verse 27 now my soul is deeply troubled should I pray father save me from this hour but this is the very reason I came father bring glory to your name when we talk about Jesus understanding exactly what we go through and all has experienced all the feelings we've experienced because he was a man, uh, even though he was God and man at the same time. Here he's experienced dread. He knows what's coming, and yet he's finding courage within even talking to himself, talking it out. You know, what am I going to do? Ask God the Father to take this away from me? Well, but this is why I'm here. This is my mission. This is my soul um one job is to be Messiah, to give my life for the world. So he's saying, as much as I'd like to do that, as much as I'd like to say, Father, please take it away from me, he said, I, I can't do that because this is why I came. So look at God the Father's response here. This is cool. This is one of the parts I, ha I do not remember this. Then a, a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name, and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared that an angel had spoken to him. God the Father himself is a witness here, in a way kind of solidifying Jesus' resolve to go to the cross. And I, I was reading in one of the notes that's in my Bible, and it says, this is the third time in Jesus' life that God's voice surrounded him in support of him and his ministry. The first was at Jesus' baptism when he says, this is my dear, dearly beloved son who brings me great joy. That's written in Matthew. Uh, the second was at the transfiguration when God said, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. That is recorded in Luke. And the third is recorded here. I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. These events would have been strong evidence of Jesus' divinity to both the Jews and the Greeks. Remember, there are Greeks listening here too, right, in this crowd, because Philip brought these people there. So Jesus is filled with dread, and right away God the Father sends him this beautiful, affirming message. You know, I've already brought glory. I know you're going to bring glory to my name again. I, I just think it's such a beautiful testament to the oneness of the Father and the Son, that, that the Father knows exactly what the Son needs to hear, and the Son is doing the Father's will. So as it goes on, the crowd... Uh, oh, then Jesus told the crowd this. This is very interesting, too. He says, that voice was for your benefit, not mine. So not only does God the Father solidify and... and uplift Jesus with his words. Jesus is saying, it's more for you than it even is for me, because it's a witness. It's showing that Jesus is God. His father spoke from heaven. People heard it. Some people thought it was thunder. Some people thought it was angels, but wow, you know, he's saying, you think this is for me? This is really for you, you know, and and I love it when the Bible says that, when Jesus says that, because he's not only just talking to those people who were there with him right then, he's talking to you and me. This is for our benefit. 
that, that God the Father came and, and validated Jesus' ministry there is also for our benefit. So he says, this voice was for your benefit and not mine. The time for judging the world has come when Satan, the ruler of the world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. I love how John adds that. He wants us to know that this idea of being lifted up wasn't necessarily lifted up in the ascension. It was really lifted up on the cross. And remember, I think we had talked about this, or I had mentioned this in another teaching, I don't remember which one, how Moses in the desert lifted up uh, the snake on the cross, and when people looked up, they were healed. And the same thing is what John is alluding to here, is he's saying, when Jesus said, I'm going to be lifted up and I'm going to draw people up to me, then what he was really talking about is the type of death he was going to have, this cross being lifted on the cross, and in so doing, saving the world, drawing people closer to God through Jesus. Really, really great, great symbolism. The crowd responded, we understood from scripture that Messiah would live forever. How can you say the Son of Man will die? Just who is this Son of Man anyway? <laughs> and Jesus replied, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. And those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light. While there is still time, then you will become children of the light. I want to be a child of the light. I don't want to live in darkness. I'm sure you don't either. Darkness is scary. and Darkness is evil. I want to be a child of the light. And he's saying, you know, put your faith in me while I'm still here. This is the last time I'm going to be here talking to you, ministering to you, teaching to you. You know, I'm the light. And that's another thing that draws us, you know. I think it's great that some of the people said, wait a minute, doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah won't die? I, I was reading a little bit about this because I was very curious about that. And uh, it, it goes back to what I had been saying in another session, I think, or thinking about in another session, that when we read about Jesus uh, in prophecy in the Old Testament, very often the prophecies are a mixture of what will happen when Jesus is a man on earth in his earthly ministry, and then what happens at the second coming when Jesus returns. And very often there are um, allusions to both, and sometimes even in the same passage. So I looked up a couple of these just to show you, for example, in Psalms, let's see, this was Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I have sworn this oath to him. I will establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on your throne from now until eternity. And all heaven will praise your great wonders, Lord. Myriads of angels will praise you for your faithfulness. So this is the, this is, you know, this is a prophecy that the Messiah, who will be a descendant of David, will reign forever. And the people latch on to that and they think, this is going to be a political king right now. We need him right now while these Romans are here. We want to put him up there and then he's just going to, he'll be there forever then. That's Messiah. Okay. But that's only their human view of it. God has a bigger plan. It's not about a political king who's going to sit on the throne. It's about a spiritual king, a godly king, a, a god. It's about God himself coming back and being king here at earth and that's Jesus second coming now if they looked at Isaiah and John is going to be quoting Isaiah here in a little while but if they if they looked at some of the verses in Isaiah uh, would be Isaiah 53 verses 5 to 9 so listen to this part uh, but he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. 
All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants or that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. If you read Isaiah 53, it's, it, and it was written hundreds of years before Jesus' crucifixion, it is like reading the story of the crucifixion, isn't it? And, and the death and the burial. So Isaiah definitely predicts that Messiah will die. So there are some people who understand that the prophecies overlap this way, that there's, there's, there's ways to understand that they are both true. Yes, he will live forever. Yes, he will die. Okay, they're both true. But people here were so intent, I think, on wanting a political king. They were just tired of these Romans. They wanted to, to have a king, a Messiah, to come and save them from that. And they didn't want to wait. They wanted the eternal part to be now. You know, the king, the Messiah who comes and who isn't going to die. This is what they wanted. Um, so they're saying, we understood from Scripture that a Messiah would live forever. How can you say the Son of Man will die? Who is the Son of Man anyway? And then Jesus goes into this explanation of darkness and light. Well, whenever you have something like this that people don't completely understand, some people are going to believe, some people are not. So this is verse 50, 37. Yeah, I think 37. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had prophesied. So now we have more of John quoting Isaiah. And this would also be in Isaiah 53. He quotes it, Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? But the people couldn't believe, for as Isaiah also said, okay, now he's going back to Isaiah 6, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Healing is always God's plan. Jesus' plan for us is to heal. He knows we're sick. In our sin you know we're sick spiritually and that also makes us sick physically this is why there are so many problems in the world it's why there are there's sickness in the world and Jesus is always saying draw to me you know draw to me because he it, it's just he he loves us that's, that's love that's love Isaiah was referring to Jesus this is verse 41 so John is explaining now what Isaiah meant Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did not believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it. Oh, many people did believe in him, however. I'm sorry. First we talked about the people that didn't. Now we're talking about the people that did. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than the praise of God. This happens in our lives too, doesn't it? It happens to me at least all the time. I want people to like me. I want people to think I'm okay. I want them to have a good time. I want them to invite me places or socialize. And very often, um, I maybe keep my mouth shut about what I really believe in terms of Jesus because I don't want to offend anybody or I don't want them to um, think differently of me. You know, I, I, I think this, we can't look too harshly on these Jewish people who were afraid because I think that happens to every one of us. There's so many times when we don't stand up for justice, we don't stand up for what's right, we don't stand up for our own beliefs 
simply because we're we're afraid of what people will think or say about us. And that's what John is saying here about these people. They loved human praise more than the praise of God. So now Jesus summarizes his whole message here. And uh, he shouted to the crowd. So he's teaching everybody. Okay, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. When you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. Remember, this is what John is all about, isn't it? He wants us to realize how many times Jesus said, I'm one with the Father. He's God, I'm God. We're one in the same. Jesus sent, was sent by God the Father, but he maintains his godliness and his connection with God the Father. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. This is verse 46. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me but don't obey me, for I have come to save the world and not to judge it. Now remember, there is a time earlier that Jesus says one of his jobs is to judge, but his job of judgment will be at the end times or at the end of our lives. His job right now is salvation. He's saying, I'm, I'm not the judge right now. I'm not judging all these people who aren't obeying me because what I'm going to do is go die, not only for you guys who love me and follow me, but for all those people who don't love me and don't follow me and don't obey me. I'm dying for them too. You know, that that is so mind-boggling, you know, that he he knows that the death he's going to die is also for the very people who do not believe in him. That's just the way it is. So he says, I will not judge those who hear me but don't obey me, for I have come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. So in other words, they have some time yet that they could maybe come to him Maybe after his death and resurrection, some of them will believe. But right now, he's saying that's going to wait till the day of judgment. Because he's not there right now. Right now, he has to focus his energy on his mission of salvation, not his job as a judge. Interesting. Um, this is 49. I do not speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life, so I say whatever the Father tells me to say. Now Jesus is saying here again, I'm one with the Father. What I say is what God is saying. What God says, he says through me. So uh, this is his kind of last hurrah of teaching with the groups of people. Um, and it, after this, he's going to just be with his disciples. So here is the last time he's going to be speaking really to the crowds. And he's saying, you know, if you're not following me now, I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to die for you anyway. <laughs> I'm here to provide salvation and healing. That's what I'm all about. But on Judgment Day, that's a different story. So that's the end of John 12. And next time we're going to go on to John 13 with a real intimate, intimate uh, time of Jesus with his disciples. A beautiful time. So until then, I hope you have a, a wonderful day and that you have some time today to experience the extravagant, unbelievable love of Jesus. Have a good one.